So, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Catherine Florence. I am a student at Concordia University and the Executive Director of the Canadian Latin American Archaeology Society. Um, so I'll be speaking about uh, Teotihuacan. Um, so time as told in La Leyenda de los Sols and the Popol Vuh has been a series of creations and destructions, each catastrophe paving the way for the birth of the next sun. The first world was made through the sacrifice of the primordial crocodilian monster Kipatli, and then the gods took turns sacrificing each other in order to be the new sun. The city-state of Teotihuacan is placed as the center of this cycle. Recently, the archaeological site has made news with the discovery of a man-made tunnel beneath the Pyramid of the Sun, which is said to be a representation of Chumostok, the earthen womb from which humanity emerged. However, the architecture of this ceremonial core has been analyzed in terms of latter written Aztec cosmologies. While these interpretations are very much valid, they have also overwritten the original religion practice there six, six centuries prior. As such, these also ignore the life of the city and the ways in which the city itself was lived in. This paper will attend to the sequences of destruction and reinvention through the site's architecture, art, and ritual, especially as it relates to the Teotihuacano religion of the feathered serpent. The physical site itself underwent periods of burning and revitalization, emerging ever stronger in the same way that a serpent sheds its skin. The inhabitants of Teotihuacan reinvented Maya cosmography and made it their own by claiming the location of the birthplace of time itself. Thus, Teotihuacan is the clearest example of cosmogony, both in myth and society. Yes. <laughs> the law of conservation tells us that something cannot be created from nothing. The same is true of this society. It didn't just appear out of the thin basin air. Permanent settlements within the basin of Mexico date to the formative period around 3,000 years ago. But our interest lies in the final century BC and the following six centuries AD. Allow me to set the scene for you. The eight square kilometers that remain at the modern archaeological site constitutes the civic ceremonial core of a city that was estimated at 20 square kilometers, around 2.3 times the size of the state of Gibraltar. Two massive roads dissect the site into quarters, the major thoroughfare being the Avenue of the Dead, as the Aztecs later came to call it. It's oriented at 15 degrees, 17 minutes off a of true north. This avenue served as the guiding plum for the rest of the city, which followed in this not quite north orientation. This plan was rigid, axial, Cartesian. The quadpartite design division symbolized the four bacabs who upheld the quarters of the cosmos in war. The city was essentially a cosmogram, a symbolic template of the universe. In this aspect, Teotihuacan has understood their city to be an axis mundi, where the natural converged with the supernatural. It was designed as a reflection of the macrocosm within the microcosm, creating pyramids that mimic mountains of sustenance, cisterns as man-made sandals, and beneath the pyramid of the sun, as I said, the cave of origin, the chthonic hole from which life, and possibly the sun and moon, emerged. The inhabitants were not just building a city, they were building their entire world. This construction sent a firm message. Here we have made a new sun, and time begins now. But the inhabitants didn't stop there. During the last half of the third century, the initial daub houses of the formative period were demolished in a stage of urban revitalization. Everything except the core ceremonial sites were razed to the ground. And this made way for a uniquely Teotihuacano structure, the apartment compound. There are approximately 2,200 compounds within 20 square kilometers, all with similar floor plans. Uh, there are basically clusters of rooms oriented over. There are clusters of rooms independently arranged around family, family patios, and sometimes including a central compound patio as well. These patios often had altars for personal ancestors and household gods. Now, household worship was not a typical Maya practice, at least as expressed in the archaeological record. 
as depictions of worship were indicated to be public displays and monumental celebration. This is not to say that there was no private devotion in Mesoamerica. Given the amount of shades and spirits said to roam the landscape, it would be far safer to appease the supernatural neighbors on a more frequent basis. Rather, what I mean is that Teotihuacan, we see it take a permanent, honored position within daily life. They carved out a central place in their homes and devoted it to the dead below and the breath above. We know that they cared deeply because they covered their walls in icons of prayer and praise. Art is a rich record of history, though it's often underused or misunderstood. Many artworks are viewed as being near accurate depictions of real events when they're actually carefully conceived constructions. I myself find myself re repeating ad nauseum that art is not, nor has it ever been, a mere reflection of the society that bore it. To this end, Teotihuacan used art to signal the end of centuries-old traditions of government and of religion. As you can see, the Teotihuacan mur murals are vivid displays of color and geometry, but their style is flat, abstract, anonymous. Human figures, where depicted, are stiff and blocky. They seem more like schematics of a person than actual portraits. You can barely see their faces through the regalia and feathers, and most of the costumes represented either relate to uh, military orders or to priestly districts. And with this, there is also a definitive lack of stele, murals, or inscriptions bearing the names of glorious rulers. And this was a deliberate omission. The intention was implicit, prioritizing the collective class over the individual identity. But uh, in typical Teotihuacan fashion, they didn't stop there. They completely demolished the canonical iconography of power. In Mesoamerica, social, political, and supernatural power was foregrounded in a distinct pantheon of gods, too many of which to name here, nor will I attempt. Uh, the one you need to keep in mind is the jaguar. Its pelts were the symbol of rulership, draped over the shoulders and hips of the urban center lords. There is nothing more noble, fierce, or powerful than the feline predator. But they're not shown in that capacity within the city. Um, they are neither man nor god, not posed triumphantly over the battlefield as we would here at Fonenpak, but rather they march in processions solely an animal on parade, as we see on the right. And always shouldering the weight of a Teotihuacano headdress. The jaguar serves the state just like any other warrior, any other citizen or priest would. And the, the people of Teotihuacan nodded their heads. Of course. The jungle feline was powerful, but he was not their king. They didn't have a king. And this is where the feathered serpent comes into the picture. Teotihuacan fashioned an icon to represent those people at home and abroad. This was the brand of Teotihuacan. Just look at the site, its face is literally everywhere. And I will give for reference that before 100 BC, when Teotihuacan was agreed to be established, the composite creature of the avian serpent held little position with the pan-Mesoamerican uh, tradition. Attribute analysis conducted as part of my undergraduate degree indicated that the record is scarce and morphologically inconsistent for 1,500 years. Only once Teotihuacan emerges from the basin does the feathered serpent take on a standardized form across Central America, across ethnic and political boundaries. And that form was established at Teotihuacan. It took the place of the jaguar as the as the center of power, pride, and patronage of the city. It was the master of time itself as a snake sheds its skin to become young again, and along with it, the year. It soared through the sky and brought rain down to the parched land. Its feathers were the most vibrant green, and its teeth were sharper than obsidian, both of which sustained the center's trade networks. Like the warriors that protected its population, it was precious and lethal all at once. 
I want to stress that very rarely in art history can we discuss dramatic shifts in stylistic mannerisms. Change is a slow thing to take root. Yet Teotihuacan is an, ex is an equally rare exception. The, art the artists that work at the site completely rejected a near ubiquitous canon of Jaguar iconography in terms of subject matter and presentation. And now we have to ask why. You see, belief can drive people to do the most awesome things in the original sense of the word. That sheer amazement and fear inspired by witnessing something indomitable. To this end, Mesoamerican belief placed the burden of sustaining existence upon humanity. Through their blood, the sun in existence was sustained. Just like the previous two features examined, these were not altars to the gods of the Maya. This was something created from the destruction of that previous canon. The Feathered Serpent Pyramid, or FSP as I might refer to it, is located at the intersection of the Avenue of the Dead and the East-West Avenue, located within the Sierra de Della, a massive structure most likely served as a civic building, essentially the literal heart of the city and the symbolic cosmogram. Serpentine heads wreathed with corona of feathers emerged drastically from the flat flames. Their bodies roll rhythmically along the sides of the pyramids like waves on a lake. There is estimated to have been 260 serpent heads adorning the, side of the sides of the pyramid, mirroring the 260 days of the calendar. The avian serpent served as a master of time, after all. So here it divides the building with its body, turning the temple itself into a calendar. And like any temple, there were prayers and offerings made to the feathered serpent. Sometimes these offerings could get quite gruesome, uh, at least by modern standards. I will not deny that ancient Mesoamerica was a bloody place, war was ubiquitous, and sacrifice was also common. But I ask, don't let your imagination run rampant. Human sacrifice was reserved for the most important of occasions, and the mass sacrifice I'm about to speak about even more so. Uh, recent excavations have uncovered at least 200 individuals interred within the foundations of the Feathered Serpent Pyramid. Many have been identified through isotopic analysis as foreigners from neighboring basin regions, buried during the beginning phases of construction. So we can see that no matter the variant of Mesoamerican religion, all shared the belief that everything was borrowed, nothing was given for free. The world had been carved out of the body of the earth and monster Kitali, and that blood debt had to be repaid. Time was no different. If time ceased, then so did the existence of humanity, and there was the tax of humans to keep the world going through sacrifice. So, 200 individuals paid that debt to the feathered serpent. Over a century after its completion, however, the front facade of the of the pyramid was stripped of its carved heads and covered over by the Anasada platform. Though it should be noted that even though this, that even then the serpent heads would have still been visible around the sides of the pyramid. There are fires elsewhere within the ceremonial core as well. And while some have interpreted this burning as the end of the idolization of the feathered serpent, I do not. There's no indication that Teotihuacan stepped away from their religion of the feathered serpent during this period of destruction. Murals of the t distinctly Teotihuacan priests, local rituals, and plumed serpents decorate the apartment compounds previously discussed, which were only erected after this destruction took place. If belief had indeed waned, there would be no need for these murals, and, and Teotihuacan would not continue to bear the plumed serpent and its emblem so consistently abroad after. Instead, I believe that this destruction should be seen as a ritual performance, ceremonially burning to encourage new growth, sweeping away the ashes of the past to welcome in the present and an uncertain future. You see, creation stories always pair Genesis with Cataclysm. When the new world is created, there is an imposing force waging for, waging for its demise. Life is paired with death, fire with fluid, and the slithering earthbound serpent 
with the flapping wings of the skyborn bird. Even within the feathered serpent, then, and the rituals carried out in its honors, we see that Teotihuacan itself embodied Cosmos. But it's no surprise, then, that Teotihuacan was itself bound to fall. It fell into disuse around the 7th century AD. The sun had set on the city of the gods. But, as the saying goes as well, the sun always rises after its darkest moment. Six centuries after Teotihuacan faded quietly into the night, a multiplicity of ethnic groups comprising the Aztec Empire reincorporated the old ru ruins into their own story of creation. It was once again the birthplace of the sun, and the feathered serpent was reinvented into their god, Quetzalcoatl. I'd like to conclude by saying that the world has been made and undone several times, according to the Aztec myth. First by jaguars, then by a hurricane, only for the next to be ended by a rain of fire, and finally by a deluge. Destruction is inevitable in this way. But the story teaches us that destruction is not the end, just a signal of change. From each end came a new beginning. And so I say we should do the same with our work. I invite you to look to the future, like the creation has told in Leyenda de los Sols. This is a new sun and a new world. Let's make of that what we will.